Hello, and welcome to the Bradley Lectures podcast at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm your new host, Jackson Wolford. Tall Fort Gang, our previous fearless leader, has left for what is sure to be an exciting career in the law. This leaves me to take the reins as we revisit some lectures from the past that remain relevant in the present. Today, we'll be revisiting a 2010 lecture by Yuval Levin, who is our very own director of social, cultural, and constitutional studies here at AEI. His lecture addresses capitalism, its roots as a moral system, and its perennial potential for moral failings. We'll hear more on that in a moment. But first, Yuval, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. So, capitalism, always an urgent topic that you were taking on at a particularly relevant time, 2010, in the unfolding aftermath of the financial crisis. Can you say a little bit about the context of the speech 10 years later? Well, you know, in one sense, 10 years is a very long time. In another sense, 10 years is a very short time. And I think both those are reflected in this speech, if you look at it now. It takes up questions that are very relevant, questions of populism and capitalism, of the role of government and the role of markets, and takes them up in a way that I think remains highly relevant and is in any case still my own view. But I also think that we can see in the circumstances, especially as they're described at the beginning here, that there has been a real change in our politics where rather than the populism of the right being fundamentally an anti-government populism, that tried somehow to defend the market economy from intrusion by the political sphere, there's been a kind of transformation in the conversation on the right. And there is a renewed critique of capitalism on the right and from the right, which in some ways this talk prefigures and maybe sees coming, but in other ways not. And so I do think that that would be closer to the center of an argument I would make now along these lines than it was 10 years ago. Well, those are all definitely things to keep in mind as we listen to this lecture, which we'll start now and talk again in just a few minutes. For friends of capitalism, the last two years have not been pleasant. First came a cascade of market calamities that seemed almost designed to confirm the most cliched and hackneyed criticisms of free enterprise, complete with reckless investors, careless lending, irresponsible borrowing, wild speculation, an assortment of charlatans, a financial collapse, signs of under-regulation, retirees losing their life savings while Wall Street fat cats get their bonuses, and even the sight of Alan Greenspan apologizing to a congressional committee for keeping the reins too loose. Then came the response from Washington, which was at least as disconcerting, if partially excusable by the pervading sense of panic. By the middle of last year, the federal government essentially owned the nation's largest bank, largest insurance company, and largest automaker, managed a substantial portion of the financial sector, and was declaring winners and losers in massive corporate deals more or less ad hoc. Meanwhile, government spending has exploded, and lawmakers are busy building new entitlement programs, even as our existing ones fall into bankruptcy. For a moment, it seemed as though all of this would cause the American public to lose its faith in the market economy. Last April, the pollster Scott Rasmussen found that only 53% of Americans agreed with the proposition that capitalism was better than socialism. But that moment passed and has been replaced by a wave of populist discontent directed as much at government as at the market. The defenders of free enterprise should not take too much heart from this turn in public opinion, though. It suggests that people are uneasy with the instability of the day, but it has not formed itself into an argument in defense of American capitalism or even a coherent case against the emerging intentions of the Democratic majority in Washington. To direct the public towards such a case, we will need to explain what is at risk and what is at stake and why it matters. Such an explanation is no simple matter. After decades of defending one tree or another, many friends of capitalism have lost sight of the forest, of what democratic capitalism is, its virtues and vices, its strengths and weaknesses, its political and moral, as well as its economic justifications. Our first task now is therefore a recovery of that understanding, which will clarify both our objections to the policy direction of the moment and our prescriptions for a better way. I hope to offer here one brief sketch of what such a recovery might involve and where it might direct us. A recovery of the case for capitalism should begin at the beginning. As always, when we want to become reacquainted with ourselves, we Americans would be wise to start with a refreshing dip into the late 18th century, when our way of life was born. In this case, we should begin by dipping into Adam Smith and the original case for capitalism before returning to our own time. 
The father of modern economics was a moral philosopher, a student of human nature and social institutions, and his theories of political economy were an element of his larger project for the direction of human passions and appetites. Smith began with a middling view of human nature, neither utopian nor cynical. He believed that although human beings were fundamentally self-interested, we could be guided towards sympathy and benevolence. Our sentiments, he said, begin with a powerful self-regard that expresses itself in our desire for attention, praise, and recognition, and motivates a great deal of human behavior. Even our sympathy begins with ourselves. We feel for someone in distress because we can imagine ourselves in his predicament. But for Smith, the fact that our self-regard expresses itself in a desire for approval offers an opening for moral education and for moderating both our passions and our animal appetites to make civilized life possible. Our ability to step into someone else's shoes allows us to reflect on our own behavior, to ask, how would what I'm doing look to someone else observing me? And in that question, in that imaginary impartial spectator, as Smith puts it, is the beginning of social order and of self-restraint, and so the first impulse to moral conformity and common social norms. This is how, in a well-functioning society, our sentimental tendencies to self-regard can become inclinations to sympathy and decency. But that well-functioning society takes work. It requires social institutions designed to channel the sentiments toward this kind of moral formation. Those institutions were Smith's lifelong obsession. He was, above all, a scholar of how social arrangements shape human souls. The great secret of education is to direct vanity to proper objects, he wrote in his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, published in 1759. Note that he says his aim is education. The idea is not to fool men into acting well or to put the products of their acting poorly to some public end. The idea is to shape character and behavior, to channel human passions toward a public good. This is a peculiar kind of moral education. Smith says plainly that there is no use in trying to persuade men to be virtuous. No amount of rational argument or recitations of a catechism will do the trick. Rather, it is the experience of life in society and the modest sympathy and conscience that develop through that experience that build in human beings the moderate virtues that Smith thinks are essential. Prudence, restraint, industry, frugality, sobriety, honesty, civility, and reliability. These are the virtues of the liberal society, Smith says. They are low but solid virtues, which can be very widely shared and not just cultivated by a noble few. And they allow for stable and productive lives and so make moral coercion by the state less necessary. These moderate virtues are, in a sense, all just versions of one larger virtue, self-command or self-control. This is what Smith thinks is really the key to the liberal society. Self-command, he writes, quote, is not only itself a great virtue, but from it all the other virtues seem to derive their principal luster. And he defines self-command as the capacity for delayed gratification and restraints upon the appetite, or in a word, discipline. Smith's great project, then, is the transformation of self-regard into self-command by means of social institutions that direct our vanity to proper objects. By arranging human relations so that there is praise or benefit to be gained by discipline, he hopes to allow people to exercise virtue and so to improve their circumstances. Smith's ambitions are very practical. Life in a free society, he writes, consists of, quote, the uniform, constant, and uninterrupted effort of every man to better his condition, end quote. The moderate virtues make this kind of improvement possible, and the wise legislator will therefore arrange things so that the moderate virtues are valued and rewarded. Smith knew that this arrangement would not be a matter of direct coercion or management. Social life is just too complicated for that. Like his teacher, Adam Ferguson, and others of the Scottish Enlightenment, Smith was endlessly fascinated by the vast gulf that often lay between the intentions motivating our actions and the consequences of those actions. So rather than by coercion, such arrangement would be accomplished in a general way through institutional forms that establish rules of the game intended to draw self-interested people towards decent means of advancing their interests, but without forcing particular outcomes. Smith made the case for this general approach in his theory of moral sentiments. And then four years later, in his lectures on jurisprudence, he sought to trace how social norms created this way come to be formalized into laws in specific areas of social life. He then collected and expanded the portions of those lectures dealing with questions of labor and commerce into a book about political economy, a book called The Wealth of Nations, and published in that fateful year of great ideas, 1776. His economics was just one element of Smith's larger vision, 
but it was a particularly important one. As a good liberal, he believed material prosperity was essential to happiness and so should be at the center of moral philosophy. He also thought wealth was a precondition for a decent society and for sympathy. We can't care for others if we ourselves are hungry. His vision of social life, therefore, required a developed economic teaching built around some institutional arrangement that could help produce prosperity while encouraging discipline and the moderate virtues by making self-command a means of bettering our condition. The wealth of nations offers just such a teaching and just such an institution, the market. So, Yvonne, as I understand it, the bulk of what you're explaining to us here in this sort of section of the speech is that Smith envisions a society where every institution, politics, economics, broader culture, all morally form and educate us. And the market is just one important tool in that process. Am I picking that up right? Yeah, I'd say so. Smith, you know, is a moral philosopher, first and foremost. That's what he was. And a lot of his concern in his various works was about the question of how you can enable people to be free, basically by closing the distance between what they should do and what they want to do, by helping them want to do what they ought to do, and so making coercion by government less necessary. In a sense, Smith is looking for a moral framework for the liberal society. And you might say that especially in his explicit moral philosophy and the theory of moral sentiments published at the end of the 1750s, he's trying to offer something like Aristotle's moral philosophy, but for the modern liberal era. And so looking for ways to ground a kind of moral ideal in the premise of a free society. And that requires formative institutions that help to shape people toward desiring the right things. And for him, in some important ways, at least, the market economy is one of those institutions. Well, let's hear just a little bit more about how Adam Smith thought that that institution of the market should work. The wealth of nations begins with a fact, not an argument. The fact that the division of labor, which had been growing for centuries in European economies, made possible enormous improvements in efficiency and in the quality of production. This process of exchange, Smith calls the market. It is the arena in which labor, capital, goods, and services are valued, traded, and bartered, and it lies at the heart of the modern economy. But the rules of the market are not self-legislating or naturally obvious. On the contrary, Smith argues, the market is a public institution. It requires rules imposed upon it by legislators who understand its workings and its benefits, its purpose. And this is where his great insight comes in. In Smith's time, under the reigning economic philosophy known as mercantilism, each of the European powers set market rules that served the interests of a few large domestic manufacturers and trading companies who worked closely with the government, putting economic policy in the service of what they took to be the national interest to advance the nation's trading position. Instead, Smith argues, legislators should govern the market in the interest of the common consumer. By turning the logic of mercantilist economics on its head and establishing a market designed for the good of the consumer, Smith believes governments could both unleash immense productivity and wealth and create economic institutions that encourage discipline, moderation, and order. That does not mean that it would serve every individual's self-interest. Smith did not think there was a perfect harmony of interests in society. Many merchants would certainly be better off without competition, and in fact, many merchants often seek to use their power or to call on friendly politicians to help them avoid competition. But a system of uniformly applied rules, which doesn't prefer large or powerful merchants, would better serve most people, and so better advantage the wealth of the nation as a whole. Smith has a very unusual definition of the wealth of a nation. Quote, the wealth of a state consists in the cheapness of provision and all other necessaries and conveniences of life, he writes. So a nation is wealthy in effect when consumer items are inexpensive, at least relative to the means of the common people. That is, a nation is wealthy when a decent life is within the reach of most. This is a very democratic, even populist, notion of the purpose of the market. The broader the reach of the market, moreover, the more efficient it will be. So Smith wants it to encompass everyone and to have society become one large market in which, he writes, every man lives by exchanging or becomes in some measure a merchant, and the society itself grows to be what is properly called a commercial society. And the commercial society, Smith insists, is also a good society. For one thing, wealth is necessary for a good society because it reduces the misery of the poor and it allows everyone to be more sympathetic and generous. 
the fundamentally popular or democratic character of the system he proposes is also an important moral point for Smith. He writes, quote, no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. And his system would allow those who live off wages, not property, to benefit more than any other economic arrangement. Most important for Smith, the market is well designed to harness self-regard to produce self-command. Market players have a powerful incentive to consider what others will think of their actions, since they have to appeal to those others as customers. And the virtues most valued in sellers and buyers are precisely Smith's moderate virtues, prudence and thrift, honesty and reliability, civility and good order, in short, discipline. It's crucial to see that self-command and discipline, not freedom, lay at the heart of Smith's case for capitalism. Yes, the market involves free competition, but that means free of the undue influence of some competitors or their political patrons, not free as an existential or an ideological matter. In fact, the competitors are forced into the pen of the market by government power and kept in it by regulation and law for the greater good. As Joseph Cropsey has put it, Smith advocated capitalism because it makes freedom possible, not because it is freedom. And it makes freedom possible by guiding people to choose to obey the rules. The question Smith sought to answer is, given that men are profoundly imperfect, can they be made to want to do good so that they do not have to be forced to do good? Smith insists throughout his writings that the answer is yes, and the free market is one important means of making that happen. It is an answer to the problem of appetite, not an unleashing of appetites. It is a case for the possibility of discipline and self-restraint, not an argument against the need for them. But as Smith might be the first to say, the fact that this was his intention hardly guarantees the consequences. And without question, the moral case for capitalism, and especially the case for capitalism as a system of discipline, has long been subject to serious criticism. <clears throat> to recover the case for capitalism beyond Adam Smith's original formulation, we have to take those criticisms seriously. So I know you get into the criticisms of capitalism in a moment, but I want to bring one up here. Smith's moderate virtues seem suited to the task of being an English shopkeeper or widget producer in 1776. But do you think in America's much talked about sort of post-industrial digital, massively agglomerated economy of 2020, there is still such a happy marriage between the skills needed for business success and social virtues. Well, if you think about these virtues like self-restraint or industry or frugality or honesty, reliability, sobriety, these forms of self-discipline still are enormously important for practical success. I think that is true in contemporary American life. They are what it takes to follow that success sequence where you have to finish school and get a job and, 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 and get married before having children that we hear about as a way of escaping poverty. All of those things are really forms of practicing these virtues. So I do think they remain very important to success. But the trouble is, of course, they don't by any means guarantee success. And more than that, the people who have the most success in our capitalist economy, are not by any means the people who most powerfully exhibit these kinds of virtues of self-restraint. The people who have the most success seem like they don't have any self-restraint or any self-discipline. And I think that tension has always been a problem in the case for the market economy. It's always been a problem in the case for these virtues in general. These are, we might think of them, I guess, as Protestant virtues, following Max Weber later than Smith. But they're core virtues of the liberal society. They're important to avoid failing, but they're not exactly the path to success. And that tension has always been important to the kinds of criticisms of capitalism that have been around since the beginning of capitalism, in some ways, of course, since well before the beginning of capitalism, as criticisms of the merchant, criticisms of kind of trading virtues, standing in place of moral virtues. I think those criticisms are serious and they need to be taken seriously. But I also do think that Smith is right, that these forms of personal responsibility that he highlights are important to succeeding. They still are. The moral critiques of capitalism have tended to fall into two categories. One, popular with those socialists and communists, is that capitalism is unfair to the poor. This is, to put it bluntly, nonsense. The poor in the West, and increasingly elsewhere as well, have had no greater deliverer than Adam Smith. 
It is true that inequality persists, of course, but the standard of living of the poor has risen dramatically under capitalism, and the potential for escaping poverty is nowhere greater than in capitalist economies. Today in America, the causes of persistent poverty have far more to do with culture than with economic injustice. But that very point brings us to the second and more serious moral critique of capitalism, that it empties social life of any higher meaning and so leaves society morally bankrupt even as it grows materially wealthy. Is capitalism, in fact, just a means of replacing material poverty with spiritual poverty? Is it, in effect, a money-making machine that burns social capital for its fuel, leaving in its wake a society of opulent nihilists? This line of criticism has a very long pedigree on both the right and the left, from some of the earliest critics of capitalism to the present day, from romantics to moralists, from postmodernists to neoconservatives. It also recalls the classical and Christian critiques of merchants as lacking in moral bearing, and especially in discipline. Trade aimed at profits, wrote St. Thomas Aquinas, is most reprehensible, since the desire for gain knows no bounds. Adam Smith expected, on the contrary, that the market would discipline society and precisely set bounds on our appetites. But as it turns out, our capitalist age is not an age of discipline. Far from it. Our society is a study in unbounded appetite, and our public life is an unrestrained gluttonous feast upon the flesh of the future. We borrow more than we can pay. We spend more than we have. We use more than we need. For all of our immense wealth, we still manage to live beyond our means. In fact, it's almost fair to say that we lack for nothing except discipline. But as Adam Smith could tell us, discipline above all is what we require to be free. This is no small problem for the case for capitalism. So what happened? In part, Adam Smith surely understated the challenges of sustaining moral norms amidst economic dynamism. His expectations rested on an assumption of what to us seems like exceptional social and moral consensus, but what to him was the reality of British life in the late 18th century. The loss of that consensus, brought about in no small part by our capitalist economy itself, is a defining fact of American life in the 21st century. And the challenge of sustaining our way of life in light of that loss is a defining problem of our political economy. An economics of growth and an ethic of restraint make for an awkward match, and the disciplining signals of the market are not enough to bridge the gap. At the very least, Smith was mistaken to assume that capitalism could produce sufficient moral authority to sustain itself. Such authority would have to come from more traditional moral and cultural institutions beyond the market. And our case for capitalism must therefore also be a case for those institutions, for the family and for religion and tradition. Democratic capitalism at its best combines the best of the family and the market, never an easy match, but one well worth sustaining. But in part, we have also corrupted Smith's vision of capitalism in ways that undermine precisely its civilizing powers and that make it increasingly difficult for us to reap the benefits of the market system as we correct for its deficiencies. The two key moral features of Smith's political economy, its democratic or popular character and its disciplining effect, have been under assault in our time. The first, especially by a growing collusion between government and large corporations, and the second, especially by a welfare state expanding its reach well beyond the needy. The case for capitalism is nothing if not a case against these two ruinous trends. Neither trend would have shocked Adam Smith. He knew that some among the wealthy and powerful would always look for exemptions from the rigors of competition, and he urged legislators to resist that pressure, to grant them. Though he was a champion of free markets, Smith was no fan of big business. Large merchants and principals of joint stock companies or corporations, Smith writes, are an order of men whose interest is never exactly the same with that of the public and who have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public and who accordingly have, upon many occasions, both deceived and oppressed it. End quote. This does not mean that they should be oppressed in return, only that they should be subject to the, to the rules of open competition without exceptions, rules that will turn their self-interest toward more constructive paths. Otherwise, both the efficiency of the market and the public's confidence in the fairness and legitimacy of the system will be dangerously undercut. Capitalism is a fundamentally populist enterprise governed in the interests of the mass of consumers, and it depends upon a clear separation between government and business. If that line is blurred, many of the benefits of the system, both economic and moral, are badly undermined. 
Meanwhile, Smith also makes clear that the near universality of the market is essential to its civilizing effects upon individual workers as well as large corporations. As more individuals, too, are shielded or excluded from the market, the organizing and disciplining power of the system will wane dramatically, leaving a vacuum that will no doubt be filled by eager legislators brimming with bad ideas. The modern welfare state has had just this effect. Welfare arose as an understandable response to the dislocations wrought by capitalism and to the poverty that we will always have with us. And when it comes to the poorest of the poor who cannot subsist without help, a decent society is not only right but obliged to offer help. But the modern welfare state extends well beyond the indigent. The largest portion of our entitlement system by far is directed to the elderly and is not means-tested to be sure that only those among them who who need help receive it. Other middle-class entitlements abound, with more to come. The way they're now designed, these enormous entitlements are not paid for, and their imminent bankruptcy, and I do mean imminent, Social Security, for instance, will begin running deficits this year, casts a giant shadow over the future of our country. But even if they were paid for, as they probably will be someday by an enormously expanded tax burden, that will mean undercutting the basic logic of the capitalist economy. It will mean that citizens increasingly give their wealth to legislators who then decide how to allocate it, rather than letting the market play the mediating role. This is not about public aid for the destitute. It is a gradual but unmistakable transformation of the character of our political economy. It is at least implicitly a reaction against the very essence of capitalism, a system that leaves economic decisions in the hands of the mass of consumers and subjects nearly everyone to the uniform rigors of market rules. Both the growing collusion of big business and governments and the growing middle-class welfare state are expressions of a long-standing technocratic distaste on the left for the market economy and especially for the democratic character of capitalism. They are attempts to allocate capital more efficiently than the whims of consumer preferences could and to provide material benefits to the public without the discipline of market rules. The core of Adam Smith's argument, borne out by two centuries of evidence, is that such micromanagement and concentration of power is neither more efficient nor in practice more benevolent than the market. In The Wealth of Nations, Smith was scornful of the state of the statesman who imagines he can get it all just right, noting that, quote, he seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces on the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses on them, but that in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece has a principle of motion of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon it. Legislators just can't know enough and can't sufficiently avoid the influence of political motives and interests to micromanage the market successfully. This is an old story. The modern age from its beginnings has involved two great forces pulling in very different directions. We might call them crudely science and democracy. Science says there is hard, verifiable knowledge available to us about the workings of the material world and that the material, the material world is all there is, so we would best meet our needs by letting ourselves be guided by technical expertise. Democracy says we should let ourselves be guided by the preferences and wishes of the people and mostly leave individuals free to pursue their happiness as they wish. These two forces, science and democracy, or technology and populism, are not always at odds, but they often are, and in the struggle between them, capitalism is certainly on the side of democracy and of the peculiar, implausible, but evidently true insight that lawful chaos, rather than managed order, is the way to balance liberty and prosperity, justice and wealth. For all the quantifiable variables available to modern economics, capitalism is not a technical or scientific system. It is basically a system for diffusing authority and decision-making power and letting people have what they want. It argues that since market success is a matter of speaking to people's preferences, leaving decisions at the level of the individual exchange is almost always going to work better to produce more wealth and more happiness. That doesn't mean society has to live at the mercy of base and degraded preferences, but it means we get beyond them by educating people's preferences and judgments rather than taking them over by moral education rather than rational control. This is why the technocratic turn in federal policy is such a problem for capitalism and why the populist flavor of the reaction to that turn these days is the appropriate flavor. But it is also why that reaction needs to be informed, refined, and elevated by a coherent argument, a case for capitalism.
So, you know, whether they are economic or moral differences in ordering priorities, there's certainly a kind of immediate partisan divide in how we react to capitalism. We have a lot of associations and baggage with that word, and you know, not all of it is very well informed, but even very well informed people seem to have two different kinds of reaction to your articulation of Adam Smith's belief that prosperity is a precondition for virtue. Some, like yourself in this speech, suggest that it is common sense, that it's hard to be good if we are hungry. Others, typically those more to the left, might argue that we don't require just some raw amount of material well-being in order to be good, but that the way in which we make or work for that prosperity is formative in itself. We need forms of labor that are dignified, control of the means of production. So do you think there's a way to reconcile these two kinds of frames, left and right, of the relation between virtue and the economy? Well, I think there are some ways to reconcile them, but ultimately I think that the call for dignity is probably miscast as a call for different forms of economic order. I think that the most significant moral challenge to capitalism arises from the fact that the market economy rests upon a kind of moral foundation that it also undermines. It requires for its workers and its owners and investors a kind of human being that it does not produce and that it can easily corrupt. And left to itself, it would prioritize consumption above every other human endeavor. It would prioritize profit above every other standard of the good. And so it could really distort our moral life as a society. And if our politics and our culture really were just extensions of the market system, then we would be an unjust society. But I don't think that's what they are. And the best case for capitalism, as I see it, is a case for markets as one crucial set of institutions in a free society that is deeply rooted in the pre-liberal soil of the West. It's one set of institutions alongside others, alongside family and religion and educational and civic and political bodies that form us and habituate us in proper ways and kept in check because they are in tension with each other. If that tension is used to keep them in check, then they really can work to our advantage together. But when they fall out of balance, and when we come to think of ourselves as only, or most fundamentally, a market society, then I do think that we can lose that sense of the significance of human dignity for the thriving of the human individual. That means that defending the market also means defending these other institutions. And that means that the market doesn't always get prioritized above those other institutions when there are tensions there. Our politics has to find a way to balance them and has to see that as its purpose. I think that's the right way to think about the moral challenge that we're confronted with in a free economy. It doesn't seem to me that that calls for a different form of economic organization than capitalism. I don't think there is really a viable alternative economic theory to capitalism, but there are viable alternative moral arrangements And we have to understand that capitalism is only economics, and economics has to be kept in its place. It doesn't run the show. So you've said that a moral society has to understand that the preservation of the market and the preservation of human dignity need to go hand in hand. Are there places where you see, either in the past or, you know, new to 2020, where an ostensible defense of the market has actually been in conflict with defenses of human dignity? Well, yeah, I think that, for example, it is very important that we understand the value of work in the lives of individuals and citizens. And so that it's important that we not mistake work for simply a way to earn income and enable consumption. So that when you find arguments, say, for a universal basic income, or when you find arguments for free trade that say that the consequences for employment opportunities simply don't matter. Those arguments, I think, miss some core truths about the nature of the human person and what our society owes its members. I think free trade on the whole is a a very great good. It enables greater prosperity. It helps our society to make progress on all sorts of fronts. 
But I think that we also have to understand that it comes with very real costs and that there are times when we have to let concerns about those costs modulate or moderate our commitment to open trade. And that among the concerns that have to be able to do that is a concern for the employment prospects of different people in our society. So that's certainly one place. In the welfare system, as I say, I think universal basic income is a terrible idea, and it is rooted in a terrible misunderstanding of the nature of human dignity and human thriving, and that ways of helping people rise in our society have got to be connected to ways of enabling people to play some part in its economic life, to work. I think those are two examples. There are, there are others, of course, where thinking that what really matters is that people have the resources to be consumers is not enough. Now, it is awfully important that people have the resources to be consumers, but we have to see that people are not just consumers and that a, a nation is not just a place to invest and work, that community is not just a collection of buyers and sellers, that there's much more to social life than economic life. Economics matters. It's important but it's not the only thing that matters. And it's just one of the things that politics has to balance in enabling a society to thrive. In the past year, following a crisis that was itself made possible by decades of increasingly cozy relationships between government and big finance, some of the largest corporations in America have become wards of the state, shielded from the consequences of their own actions and decisions, and subjected to the control of the political class. Properly understood, the case for capitalism is not a case for license or for laissez-faire. It is a case for national wealth as a moral good, for the interest of the mass of consumers as the guide of policy, for clear and uniform rules of competition imposed upon all, for letting markets set prices, letting buyers make choices, and letting producers make what they think they can sell while protecting consumers and punishing abuses. It is a case for avoiding concentrations of power, for keeping business and government separate, and for letting those who can meet their own needs do so. And it is a case for the moderate virtues, encouraged by market pressures, but finally drawn from deeper wells, from the wisdom of tradition, the love of the family, and the divine and mysterious tug of a love beyond love, all of which must in turn be supported, encouraged, and strengthened. And here, finally, is perhaps the most daunting challenge confronting the friends of capitalism today. Adam Smith was right to say that the virtues of self-command and discipline are utterly essential to capitalism and to the liberal society more generally. But he was wrong to think that democratic capitalism could produce them on its own. These virtues, in fact, run against the grain of our liberal capitalist culture and so have to be sustained by a constant resistance and friction and a constant recurrence to older pre-liberal sources of wisdom. This can be unpleasant, and it is a duty all too easy to shirk. The cause of restraint, frugality, and discipline certainly lacks visceral appeal. American capitalism is in trouble today because we have grown forgetful of the case for it. It is under assault not by socialist ideologues, but by misguided technocrats who know not what they do. The public is unhappy, even angry, at the sight of their recklessness, and the populist pitch of the moment is the right one, since it is precisely the popular character of democratic capitalism that is threatened most. But the pitch alone will not do, and the anger of the outrage could just as easily come to be turned against the market as marshaled in its defense. Angry as we are, we must be clear about our purpose. This general purpose, of course, has to take form in specific instances and choices, and exactly how the broad conceptual argument for capitalism should be translated into policy is always a matter of case-by-case -case prudence. But that doesn't mean that we can do without the broad argument. The argument first framed by Adam Smith and refined by two centuries of theory and practice. The argument that helps us see what democratic capitalism means and why and how we should sustain it. In the coming years, it is incumbent upon the friends of capitalism to rise to its defense, and therefore first to understand its character as both an economic and a moral enterprise, one whose health and strength are essential to the future of the larger American enterprise. All right, Yuval, I have a confession to make. While talking about capitalism is certainly never irrelevant in American politics, there is a reason I thought it might be especially good to talk with you today. So earlier in September, you co-signed an open letter that called for workers to have a, quote, seat at the table. Now, one of the options that was offered in this letter was strengthening and reforming labor organizations in this country. 
Is this kind of strategy a response to what you think might be a worsening situation the last 10 years? Or is this just completely in line with your recommendations that you give in this speech? Oh, I think it is. I mean, you know, that letter appealed to me in part because it begins by recognizing the enormous value that capitalism brings to our society and the enormous advantages it has brought, especially for lower income people, helping them to rise in our society and in the world. But as we do that, we have to recognize that human beings are not just consumers, are also citizens, are also members of communities and families, and are also workers. And I think that organizations of workers have to be understood in some ways, first and foremost, in communal and civic and social terms. They are essential mediating institutions. They also play an important economic role, and they matter there too. I certainly think that their significance, particularly as civic institutions, is part of the argument I made then and part of the argument I would make now. I don't think that a commitment to market economics means ignoring workers and their concerns when we think about setting policy and when we think about making economic decisions. Now, labor unions in America have become essentially national political organizations rather than being local civic and communal organizations of workers. And for that reason, I think that they do need to be rethought, as that letter suggested, that we need to think from the bottom up about what it would mean to enable workers to take some part in economic decision making. But I do think that those questions are enormously important and that we should find ways of making that possible. Well, you've all thank you again. And thank you to all of you who have joined us for our discussion of this lecture. We hope it gives you some food for thought and that you'll join us next time here at the Bradley Lecture Series podcast. Thanks and goodbye.